Good evening. It is good to be back together. It is good to see you. You know, Dave texted me during the week and he said, do you have any songs you want for Sunday night? And I said, no, not really. I said, you know, but just to let you know, we haven't been back together in seven months. Don't blow this. And then, uh, <laughs> then I felt bad because a lot of those big fish that you see me catch and I put on Facebook, those are at Dave's place. So I repent in dust and ashes. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for those great songs. So you can turn to Psalm 107, that's where we'll be tonight, as we give part two to our lesson this morning. You know, a man was the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and he was able to make out of some of the cargo a raft, and he floated over to a deserted island where he made himself a makeshift shelter. He also salvaged some supplies, provisions from the shipwreck so he could, he could eat for a, a little while anyway. And quite often, ships would pass by this deserted island, and he would try to get their attention, but to no avail. So one day, he notices a ship going closer to the island than normal, and so he hurriedly makes a, a signal fire, but he sees the ship go on by and fade off into the distance. And so he's distraught, he's, he's got his head down, he's crying and not paying attention to the fire that he had set, and it burns his little makeshift hut to the ground. But thinking everything was lost, that he had nothing left, he couldn't survive any longer on the island, he didn't think, he sees the ship that had passed turn around, and it's coming back. And they rescue him, and they bring him on board. And he goes up to the captain, and he says, thank you so much, but may I ask, what, what was it that got your attention? He said, well, the fact that you set your own house on fire, that's why we turned around. We saw the smoke. That's not supposed to be humorous. That's, you know, actually to make the point that the very thing that seemed to seal his doom was the thing that provided deliverance. And that's kind of the way it is with us as well, right? I mean, so often we're at the end of our rope with nowhere to turn, and that's where we find total dependence. If you're like me, I'm one that tends to be self-reliant. I like to do it myself. I like to, you know, I like to figure it out on my own, and then I find myself in trouble, and then I want to cry out for help. And that's kind of the way it is with God's people. We see that over and over again, reiterated in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. We're like that as human beings, many of us. I'm not unusual in that respect. And to some degree, that's okay, right? At least you're turning to God. But obviously, we don't want God to be our last resort. We want Him to be our first option, plan A, not plan B, right? I think I've told you before, but before my, my father was baptized, I prayed daily for his spiritual well-being. And I prayed that God do anything and everything to get his attention so that he would turn his life around. And lo and behold, it was a heart attack that almost ended his life. And before he was going in for major open-heart surgery, he called me and he said, Bubba, that's what he calls me, Bubba, he said, uh, I need to take care of this. And so Robert Odell and I hopped in my pickup, and we, we drove all the way to Perigold, Arkansas, 10 hours to baptize him, and drove back, and it was well worth it. But I thank God often for a heart attack. Who would have thought that that would be the thing that turned him around? And so when we pray these dangerous prayers, we got to be ready for however they are answered and be ready to take advantage, because when God provides deliverance, it may not be the easy way out. It may be rather difficult. And that's what Psalm 107 is really about. It's about thanking God for deliverance. But before that deliverance, there was a whole lot of heartache and trial and tribulation. From verse 4 to verse 32, what we see here are four pictures of deliverance. And we see four different groups that are delivered. Okay? And here are the groups. You have the wanderers, the prisoners, the sick, and the overwhelmed. Let's look at the first. The wanderers. They are lost in the wilderness. They are longing for home. They are hungry. They are thirsty. Sounds a lot like the Israelites, doesn't it? And with good reason. I mean, Psalms is Israel's hymn book. We've said that before. It's their song book. And so why is this psalm included? Because it tells a lot about their history. Notice verse 4 and following. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. 
They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go into an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. What's worse than being lost? Not realizing it, right? And so these folks that found deliverance, they had to first realize that they were lost. It's kind of like the grandmother that took her grandkids to Disney World. And she buys them a little flag, and they go and watch the parade, and she looks down, and the littlest one, the four-year-old, is gone. And she looks frantically for him as the parade's passing by. She sees him at the back of it, waving his flag, going along with the parade, not realizing that he was lost. There's a lot of people like that. A lot of people roaming around us every day that are lost and don't even know it. Many folks going through life without even an inkling that they are lost. You know, one day the parade's going to be over. One day the band's going to stop playing, and unless something changes, they're going to walk right into eternity all alone. And verse 9 tells us that the kind of people God helps are the hungry and the thirsty. That the one who recognizes their desperate need is the one that God fills. Wanderers find deliverance when they seek a divine guide. So there's another group here. And it's the sick, or excuse me, the prisoners first. So we see the prisoners. This group, as you could probably guess, is in captivity. Again, sounds like the Israelites, doesn't it? With good reason. Because again, this was their plight. God's punishment was not because he wanted to see them suffer. His punishment was benevolent in nature. He wanted what was best for his children. And sometimes you need a wake-up call. Look at verses 10 and following. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart and labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. So many people satisfy their hunger and quench their thirst in unrighteous ways. But it's like... It's like devouring raw fish or or drinking spoiled milk, right? So many people want to satisfy a thirst that they have or a hunger that they have, but they do so with things like, like raw fish or spoiled milk. And you think you have hunger pains? You think you're dying from thirst? Try satisfying that with raw fish or, or spoiled milk. The latter is going to be worse than the former, right? So there are some things worse than the hunger and thirst that you have. Here's the deal. We might look at someone who satisfied their hunger or thirst with sin and say, well, you know, that's their own fault. I mean, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it. I don't feel sorry for you. This is what you've done to yourself. But God intervenes. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. God hears and he acts, even though it's their own fault, even though they did this to themselves. God says, it's okay, you cry out to me, I'm going to be here. Because I want what's best for my children, and sin is not it. Captivity is not it. Look at the third group, the sick. Notice verse 17 and following. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. This group is clearly sick because of sin. They thought that they could, they thought that they could sin without penalty, but they were wrong. And once again, notice how God lets them reach the point of total despair. It says, they drew near to the gates of death because sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you realize that the only way out is up. Sometimes you've got to hit that bottom, that lowest point, less than zero, before you realize that I've got to come to the end of myself 
and reach out to the only one who can save me. Many people get sick. Many people put off going to the doctor because they think that they can ride it out. And then they go to the doctor and the doctor says something like, well, you should have come in weeks ago. This is way beyond anything I can do. We're going to have to send you to a specialist or put you in the hospital or whatever. But I doubt any doctor worth his salt is going to see someone come in and go, you know what, you waited too long, you missed your window, go on home. Even if it was their own fault, even if they didn't come and get the help that they needed when they needed it, no doctor worth his salt is going to turn them away. He's going to still try to treat them. He's still going to try to make them better. That's God. Though we're lying on our deathbed, all because that we are infected with the, the sin in our lives, we're sick because of our own doing. Even though we're on our deathbed, God answers the 911 call and he rescues us in our sickness. But then, look at the fourth group, the overwhelmed. Notice verses 23 through 32. See if you fit in this group. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, they went down into the depths, their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet, so he guided them to their desired uh, haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. You ever been overwhelmed by circumstances that were beyond your control? If, if you've ever taken a ride on a boat and the sea was real choppy, the water was real choppy, you almost might get seasick even reading this, right? But you understand that while you can't control the waves and while you can't control the wind or the storm, there's somebody who can. It is God who provides the deliverance. I like how a man by the name of Derek Kinder put it. He said, we live by permission, not by good management. It's like the lady who was so overwhelmed by her circumstances that she asked her kids what she must do. And the kids said, well, I mean, the only thing left to do is pray about it. And she said, oh my, has it come to that? Yeah, I mean, it really should be the first thing you do, right? It always comes down to that. And again, this is not a last resort. This is plan A. This is the very first thing that we should do. So there's four word pictures given here in Psalm 107 meant to highlight the fact that every human crutch eventually gets knocked away, doesn't it? Every human crutch eventually gets knocked away, and all that we're left with is our dependence on our creator and sustainer. And the rest of this psalm is a summary of God's ways. Verses 33 and 34 speak of people who live in a fruitful land with abundant water. They believe that they are set for life, but because of their disobedience, God turns their fertile land into a wasteland. Sodom and Gomorrah would be exhibit A. Verses 35 through 38 describe people living in a dry wilderness. They are hungry, but God feeds them. Verses 39 and 40 describe those who take God's blessing and then forget about God. They become self-reliant and depend on their own efforts, and so God causes them to wander aimlessly. And then verses 41 and 42 speak of how God sets the needy on a high place to protect them. He blesses them so that the righteous rejoice and the wicked are silenced. It's not just that God does these things to his people because he wants what's best for them. He also wants the wicked to see what kind of God that he is. To see that they're missing out. Okay, so now that we've dissected the whole psalm, I just want to take about 30 minutes to kind of make application. No, not 30 minutes, but I do want to take a little bit of time to just make some application. It won't take near 30 minutes, but what does all of this have to do with us? Well, go back to verses 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Have you been redeemed? Have you? Have you been redeemed? 
And if so, then say something. Say something about it. Talk about it. Everywhere you go speaks to your redemption. How you live, how you act, how you think, how you speak. If the redeemed of the Lord are out there, then say something. Promote the one who has redeemed you in everything that you do because you are among the rescued. And do you know what rescued people do? They talk about being rescued. You can't shut them up about it. They want to tell their story over and over again. I mean, if you were wheeled into the emergency room unconscious and your kids don't know what's wrong with you, and they wheel you in there and some doctor comes along and figures out that it's some rare thing that he treats you for and all of a sudden you get better, you were saved from death, you know what you're going to do? You're going to leave that emergency room and you're just going to go about your business ever talking about it again. No, that's not what you're going to do. If somebody asks you about the doctor that saved your life, you're, yeah, yeah, he's all right. No, you're going to promote him, right? You're going to talk about him and say all the wonderful accolades about him that you can think of because you had a near-death experience. You should be dead, but that event changed you. You are changed forever because of that event. You would live life differently. You would revere your doctor and your nurses. You would credit them with saving your life, and you would rave about them to anyone who would listen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the wanderers who are hungry and thirsty say, Thank you. I am filled. I am no longer thirsty. As Christians, we maneuver through this life when we are, when we are uh, following God's will with Him as our guide, as our GPS. But before that, we were on our own, right? We were aimless. But thanks be to God that He gave us a direction. He gave us bread and water. Your reflexive response should be to shout the words, I'm redeemed. Thank you for my rescue. Let the captives who are under bondage say, Thank you, I've been redeemed. You were once a slave, now you're free. And do you know what free people do? They talk about their freedom. They can't get over it. Let those who have been set free rejoice, for he shattered the gates of uh, bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Let the sick say, thank you. I've been made well. I am healed. All of us are stricken with an incurable virus known as sin. Actually, we are dead in our trespasses, not just sick. We are dead in our trespasses, but the great physician has healed us. There is definitely a balm in Gilead. And it makes the sin sick well. And do you know what the terminally ill do when they've been cured? They rejoice. They sing, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. And to the overwhelmed, they say, thank you. I am redeemed. Those of us who have been overtaken by the storms of life can find refuge in the God who is in control. When we realize that our Lord is in the boat with us, we find comfort and strength because peace is not found in the absence of storms. Peace is found in the presence of God. And knowing that He is on the boat with us gives us peace. Those who find peace amid the storm sing out, Hallelujah, I'm redeemed. Last year, I had the opportunity to go back to Missouri and preach in a gospel meeting about 45 minutes from where I came from. And so I stayed in Cassville and just drove back and forth each night. But on my way up there, I received a phone call from a good friend of mine telling me that another good friend of mine in the congregation had passed away unexpectedly. There were two ladies in the congregation, Lana and Chloe. Both were widows, and I loved them dearly, and they loved me dearly, and they treated me and my family like gold. I love these ladies, and Lana and Chloe were so close. And Chloe passed away unexpectedly. And so when I arrived in Cassville, I stayed with one of the elders who was a friend of mine. We hopped in the car and we immediately drove over to Chloe's house where all her family was gathered. There was laughter, there were tears as we talked about her life. We talked about my time there and, you know, Chloe owned a, she owned a jewelry store. It was a family store. Cassville is a town of about 2,900, and there's a town square. It's, a, it's in the Ozarks, beautiful place. And she owned a, a jewelry store on the town square and was always giving me gifts at a reduced rate so I can give to my wife and you know, treating the kids like they were special. And so while I was there, they said, if you're going to be here for a while, and I was, I was going to be there for a week, they said, would you do the funeral? And I said, absolutely. 
Well, the funeral took place, the burial anyway, on a huge hill. Cassville is the city of seven valleys, and so it's very hilly. It's in the Ozarks, and there's a big hill in town that has the cemetery, and Oak Hill Cemetery, and that's where the burial was, and folks, it was cold. 16 degrees, it was snowing. I didn't bring a heavy coat, and so I had to borrow one, and I'm out there trying to get through it as quickly as I can, but wanted to say some nice things about Chloe because she was easy to talk about. Such an easy lady to talk about. But one of the things that I realized when I was putting together kind of my thoughts about Chloe was that she left this earth very similar to the way that she lived her life on the earth. No fanfare, very unassuming, very quietly. She went to bed the night before not knowing anything was wrong and never woke up. That was it. And if you knew Chloe, it was the perfect ending to the life of Chloe because she was so unassuming and quiet. But here's one thing she was not quiet and unassuming about. You knew she was a child of God. She spoke often about redemption. She was a walking billboard for redemption. She loved the song, I'm Redeemed, because it was personal for her. It should be for us as well. Do we think about it? Does it drive us? Are we a walking billboard for Christianity, for redemption? Because here's the truth. All of us that are Christians have had a near-death experience. All of you were plucked from the fires of hell and given a new life. And a near-death experience should change you in a profound way. We are now alive in Christ. It should have a profound effect on the way that we think, the way that we talk, the way that we act. Our only response should be to shout, I'm redeemed. If he saved you, then say something. Right? Let's pray. Most kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for redemption. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for the price that was paid, and the blood that purchased us. May the redeemed of the Lord say so. May we shout it from the mountaintops. May we sing it loud and clear. May others around us, everyone around us, know that we extol you, that we celebrate you, that we're no longer wanderers, we're not overwhelmed, we're not imprisoned, and we're not sick. We are redeemed. Thank you, God. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Can we help you tonight? Do you have a need? Redemption is where it all starts. If we can help you to learn what it means to be redeemed, then we want to do that tonight. Don't leave here without hope. Don't leave here without being right with God. Dave is going to lead us in a song. If we can help you, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing?